Hello, this is a lecture for Physics 122. This is the first lecture of Physics, Physics 122. And like before, I want to, want to start, I want to remind you of the building blocks of physics that we have out there. Okay? If you took my course on Physics 120, you're going to, you're going to remember, remember that there are three important building blocks of physics. The basic quantities, the primary definitions, and the laws of physics, or the laws of nature. In, for the basic quantities, there are a total of seven basic quantities. But for now, I will tell you, you already know about three of them, and I'm going to tell you one more. And we're going to talk about we're going to have a total of four for now. There are three more that I'm going to introduce to you later on. Okay? The primary definitions is what I told you there in Physics 120, which are the position and force. And the laws of physics, which is a law of physics, is a genetic and encompassing statement that can explain several types of phenomena. Several types of phenomena, okay? The greatest contribution that you can make to science is to discover a law of nature. In mechanics, in physics 120, we saw four laws of physics. Three laws of motion and the and the law of universal and the law of universal gravitation. Okay, so let's go back here to our basic quantities. And in the case of physics 120, you know, we all grow up with those three types of quantities that I introduced to you in physics 120, okay? We have those things, that we take those quantities for granted because we grow up with them. And for physics 122, I'm going to introduce you another basic quantity that everybody here is familiar with, it's called the quantity of temperature. Treat all those four quantities as though as they are independent of one another. Okay, so treat all, here we go, treat all these basic quantities as though as they are independent of one another. One doesn't depend on the other. Length doesn't depend on time. Mass doesn't depend on length. Time doesn't depend on mass and temperature and so on. Okay, and and let's talk about the concept of temperature. The, the concept of temperature is central to chapter 13. This idea of temperature is central to chapter 13 of the book. Okay, and and it's an idea far more abstract than the other three. Think about that. Length, you know, we can, we can have a, an object, right? And, and have a, an idea of its length in terms of the size of the palm of your hand. The time, we can have an idea of time in terms of the motion of the sun in the sky. And the mass in terms of how heavy a given object is, okay? But temperature is something a little bit more abstract than the other three. It's uh, the idea of temperature, I can tell you, the idea of temperature started with the human senses. Think about that, okay? Cavemen, when they were trying to make sense of this world, they start thinking what would be a good concept to create, to understand the world. 
And they finally came up with this idea of temperature that today we take it for granted. Okay. The unit in the international system of units for the temperature is the Kelvin, but there are other units for temperature, but that's the one we use most of the time. So keep that in mind. But what's temperature? Okay. What is temperature? A very good way, here, a very good way of starting understand understanding what temperature is is by performing a very simple experiment. A very simple experiment. Okay, which is described in the book, which is described in the book. Illustrated, not described, but illustrated in the book. Remember, folks, all those ideas that we're discussing, it always start with the human senses. It was only later on that we start to better quantify those quantities by using instruments. The first device capable of quantifying temperature was only invented back, back in the 1500s by Galileo Galilei. Okay, they would call that a thermoscope. So caveman was not able to quantify temperature with an independent device, a device that was independent of the human senses. Okay, cavemen most likely start quantifying temperature with the feelings that he had, with the senses, with the touch, with the sense of touch. Okay, and here your book has a very good example, a very good illustration of how temperature can be how temperature works, okay? This, here go, figure 13.1 in the book. Okay. So here you go, Con consider, you know, you have a cold pot with ice, a pot with water and ice, and another pot with water that was warmed up in the fire. And then in between them, we have this third pot with lukewarm water. Okay? Try to do this, this experiment there at home. Okay? That, this experiment was first described by, in 1690 by this philosopher John Locke. You know, it's a very simple experiment, but it's a very important one that gives us a better idea of temperature. So what's going to happen? Here you go. I go ahead and put my right hand in the cold water with ice and my left hand in the hot water that was warmed up in the, in the fire. Okay? So each hand is going to have a different sensation. Right? The hand in the hot water is going to feel kind of stingy. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to steam because the hot water is going to interact with the skin. And, but the cold water is going to have a different sensation. It's not going to feel stingy. You're not going to feel sting. But you're going to feel something else that, uh, that's very different from what you have on the, on the right hand. Okay? So in the next step, so, so that's the first step to... Quantify, not quantify, but to have a qualitative idea of temperature. Two different objects that has different feelings. And then we go the next step. Okay? And then we go the next step. We go ahead and put our two hands, and now we're using those hands as thermometers, right? And thermometer is not the, the exact, uh, it's not a proper word. A proper word for that should be thermoscope. Okay? There's a difference between thermoscope and thermometer. 
So now we're going to get those two hands and I'm going to insert it in the like warm container. Something interesting is going to happen. Try to do that at home. Okay? The left hand that was in the cold water is going to start to feel stingy. It's going to feel a sensation that is very similar to the one that the initial sensation that the right hand had. Whereas the right hand is going to have this sensation initially of the cold water. Even though I am I have inserted my both hands, both hands in the in, in the water that has the same temperature, the sensation of those two hands are going to be different. Okay? So very important to understand that. But only for some time. It's not this sensation, this different sensation between the two hands is not going to last forever. Little by little, those two hands are going to start to feel almost in the same way. So there is a time lag. What we have here, we have a time lag for measurement of temperature with this device of yours, that's the human hand. With this device of yours that can be used as a sensor for temperature. Okay? So, what does it tell us? Okay, what does it tell us? It tells us that uh, if you're going to make a measurement of temperature, you have to wait some time. There is a time lag to make this measurement. Your hand doesn't, your hand as an instrument doesn't respond right away to the sensation of temperature, to the sensation of same temperature. Initially, the, the hand that was in the cold water is going to feel that the water is hot. And this hand that was in the hot water is going to feel that the, the same water is colder than the other one. So in a way, the human senses is not a very good thermoscope. Okay, but only initially, only initially, because eventually there will be a point in which both hands are going to have exactly the same sensation. That takes some time. There is a time lag between for, for something like that to to happen. Okay? It's the same with with thermometers. Thermometers, if you're gonna make a measurement with a thermometer, an actual device, you have to wait some time. You do have to wait some time. And this, this time lag, you, we have this time lag because something is happening along the way. When I insert my hand into the loop like you are, what's, what's happening? Well, what's happening is what we call my hand or my thermometer is reaching thermal equilibrium. While the two hands have different senses in the same water, they are not in thermal equilibrium with the medium yet. That's the idea of thermal equilibrium. Once they reach thermal equilibrium, then you do have a proper sensation of temperature. Then both hands are going to sense the same temperature. So that's the idea of thermal equilibrium, which is associated with the idea of temperature. So there is another important part here. The book says that uh, when we insert our hand in the water right away, in the same water, they're going to have a different sensation. And the book concludes that we cannot trust our senses to measure temperature. Well, that's half true. That's not completely true. Okay? We can trust our senses to measure temperature, but you have to wait. You have to wait for your hand, for both hands to reach thermal equilibrium. So let's uh, make it clear, right? So let's go ahead and document what we said, right? Okay. 
Okay, so in this experiment, in this experiment, we have the following steps. One. We have three containers with water, with hot water, cold water, and lukewarm water. Okay. We insert the right hand inside the cold water. And the left hand in the hot water. According to our senses, here you go, according to our senses, the left hand will feel different from the right hand. The left hand will have a sting sensation. The left hand will have a sting sensation. Whereas the right hand will have a much different one, a much different sensation. At this point, we can say that my left hand is in a warmer medium than the right hand. hand. Next, we introduce both hands inside the lukewarm container. And what happens? And what happens? And what happens? Okay, so if our hands, if our senses, right, were an ideal type of thermometer, okay, both hands would feel exactly the same. However, our senses is not this ideal instrument. So what happens? So what happens? And, and the feeling that you have is that the right hand is initially sensing a warmer temperature than the left hand. Instead, right, the feeling that you have is that the right hand is initially sensing a, a warmer temperature than the left hand. Okay, to say that uh, we cannot trust our senses is only partially true. Partially true. Why is that? Well, we, in this experiment, why is that? Because in this experiment, 
we cannot trust our senses only initially. However, as time goes by, both hands start to reach an equilibrium in which their senses coincide. At this point, comma, we say that both hands reached thermal equilibrium, which is a concept important to achieve proper temperature measurements. So keep that in mind once you once you think about temperature. Keep that in mind. In order to measure temperature, we must reach what we call thermal equilibrium. The right hand feels warmer because there is some energy being exchanged between the water and your hand. Energy, heat energy, thermal energy is moving towards your, your right hand. But in the case of the left hand, it's all the way around. Because the left hand was in a warmer environment, it is the thermal energy, the thermal energy of the left hand is moving to the water. And once you don't have this this feeling, these different sensations in both hands, we say that we the hands reach a thermal equilibrium. Okay, so two important ideas, right? So two important ideas. Temperature and thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium is an idea that comes from energy. So just recall what we cover in physics 120 when we cover the idea of energy. So we can say that thermal equilibrium is whenever we don't have transfer of energy between different objects. The transfer of thermal energy between the two different objects. This is achieved whenever the temperature is the same. Okay, so you go by definition. Thermal equilibrium of course whenever there is no transfer of energy between objects. This is achieved when their temperature is the same. So, okay, so now that we have talked, so keep in mind, first we, start, we talked about temperature, and then Let's talk about thermal equilibrium, which, by the way, is related to energy. A concept that we saw in physics P120. Okay. Now that we have defined, now that we have define both terms. Now we can go to the next step, that is formulate 
the first law, not the first law, but we call it the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Now, we are ready to formulate the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And the way we do that is, you know, consider three objects. I'm gonna, you gotta memorize this law, right? A, B, and C. The zero law of thermodynamics states that if A is in thermal equilibrium with B and B is separately in thermal equilibrium with C, come on, then A must be in thermal equilibrium with C as well. That's a law that you have to memorize. The first law of thermodynamics, and now we can add that to our table of building blocks of physics. Let's do that. Okay. We have the concept of temperature here, which is a basic quantity. All those concepts, don't forget, they are all scalars. The primary definitions, they are all vectors. Now we have another law of physics in thermodynamics. Dynamics. The zero law of physics, the zero law of thermodynamics. I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to highlight this one as well. Italicize. Okay, so this law is stated here in the book. Two objects are in each in thermal equilibrium with the third object, and the two are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Okay, this is a different way of formulating the zero law of thermodynamics, but thermodynamics, but means exactly the same thing. Okay, so here you go. And B is separately in thermal equilibrium with C, then A must be in thermal equilibrium with C as well. So in a graphical format, we can say that if uh, two objects are in thermal equilibrium with one another, A in thermal equilibrium with B, and B is separately in thermal equilibrium with C, this implies that A is also in thermal equilibrium with C. Okay, so here it shows clearly that those two objects are separately in thermal equilibrium with respect to those other two. That's another way to memorize this, this law, which, by the way, is important. 
and we use it to measure temperature. Now we are going to talk about temperature scales. Okay, so temperature scales. There are, you know, there are three main temperature scales. The most important one is the Kelvin. Yeah, Kelvin. Most important one, K. Most important one. The next one that's important is the Celsius or centigrade. Or centigrade. And it is abbreviated a degree C. And you are all familiar here in the United States with the Fahrenheit scale and the Fahrenheit scale, which is represented by the symbol degree Fahrenheit. They all are defined differently. Okay? They are they are all defined differently. All those three scales, but you know they should be able to provide the same measure of the temperature. It's just with a different number. So you can convert one temperature to another. In order to convert a temperature from degree C to degrees Fahrenheit, there is a very straightforward equation how to convert from centigrade from Celsius to Fahrenheit. It's uh, I'm going to type the conversion here for you. Here you go. Temperature in Fahrenheit, given a given temperature, let be a given temperature be measured in Celsius. The temperature in Fahrenheit will usually be higher than that in Celsius. So the conversion is like that. Okay, uh, the exact conversion: nine fifths of the temperature measured in of the numeric value in Celsius plus 32 degrees. So note see that this ratio here is approximately 2. So if you do not remember what the ratio is, just remember that it's 2. And then you do something else. You, you subtract 2 from 10%. Okay? So 9 fifths is in reality what? Do the math, right? 9 fifths is 1.8 which, by the way, is 2 minus 10% of 2. 2 minus 0.2. I think we have to remember that. Okay? This, this 32, you have to memorize. If you want to do a back-of-the-envelope calculation without getting the exact value, you can just, you know, approximate this ratio here to, to the number 2. But if you want to be precise, just remember that's 2 minus 10% of 2. Okay, a good way to memorize the multiplicative factor, the multiplicative factor on the right side of the equation, the right side of the equation, is to remember 
that it is 2 minus 0 0.2. 2 minus 10% of 2. Or, or 1.8. Or 1.8. If you want to convert on the other way, convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius, Fahrenheit to Celsius. So you have to invert the equation. Okay, so let's do that. Here you go. What do you do? Invert this equation. I have a solve for Tc. Okay? So we do it step by step. We pass 32 to the other side. becomes a negative sign. We pass the ratio to the other side and at the same time we invert. And that's the conversion that we end up getting. Okay, it looks like that. So instead of uh, 2 minus 0.2, it's going to be approximately a little bit more than half. Right? 5 divided by 10 is half. 5 divided by 9 is a little bit less than half. So those are two different scales. The how the how the Celsius scale was set up. They were set up differently. Right? Here you go. The Celsius is just a matter of how you define the graduations in your in your scale. In the Celsius scale or centigrade, right? Celsius or centigrade. Centigrade because of a hundred comes from a hundred. Okay, in the centigrade scale, zero is set up is set at the freezing point of water, and one hundred degrees C at the boiling point of water. So let's uh, let's see what uh, 100 degrees C correspond to Fahrenheit. What would be the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit? We can do this math, right? When I use my favorite software to do that, we go. It's uh, is an algebraic manipulator software. So the software is this one right here, is live math. I can do calculations very quickly with this live math while you see the equations in the way they're supposed to look like. Okay, so here you go. Conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Okay, degrees in Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths of degrees in Celsius plus 32. Okay. So what we want to do, we want to convert 100 degrees C. Into Fahrenheit. I'm not putting this symbol of degrees there. To just to you know simplify the problem here, here. So what we get, we get approximately two hundred twelve. 
notice that it's almost twice as much, right? Take a look. If degree C is 100, depending on the temperature, you are going to get a Fahrenheit temperature that's almost twice as much. That occurs especially for large degree C's, for large values of degree C's. The higher the, degree, the temperature in degree C, the, the closer the temperature in Fahrenheit is going to be approximately twice as much. So let's go out now in 200, for instance. Here you go. See, what you're getting for Fahrenheit is approximately twice what you get in degree C. And that's what we call a rule of thumb. For large temperatures, you can say that the temperature in Fahrenheit is a, approximately twice as much. If you put 300 degrees C here, let's see what you get. You know, 572, okay? If you put 1,000, it's not going to be 2,000, but it's going to be a, a, a close to 1,800, right? Because this term here is 1.8. There is just this is small difference between 1800 and the actual value. So that's how we do the conversion. Now let's go back to 100. Zero degrees C is going to be 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a quick way to convert temperatures between. Fahrenheit and Celsius, and the same from Celsius to Fahrenheit, and you can invert the equation to get the opposite way. Okay. Now we come to the to the important scale. But wait a minute, because before we go quickly, before we go to to Kelvin, Kelvin, very important. Okay. That's the equation that transform the degrees Fahrenheit in degrees C, and that's the equation that transforms degrees C in degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So suppose, you know, suppose you have a temperature, suppose you have a temperature of 100 degrees C, another example. Another example. Okay. Suppose you have a 100 degrees C temperature, and this temperature increases by one degree C. By one degree C. The question is: By how many degrees Fahrenheit? How many degrees Fahrenheit? How many degrees Fahrenheit does this temperature change? Okay. So, in other words, if you have a, in other ways, in other, I'm gonna reformulate this problem. If you have a one degree C variation in a given temperature, how many the variation, how many degrees Fahrenheit does your temperature change? Okay. So I'm going to solve this problem here quickly for you. Here you go. I'm going to do like that. OK. Solution. We can do this problem mathematically. OK, so we have, let's say, we have this initial temperature in Fahrenheit, and we have this initial temperature in C. Well, put. Uh, did not representing okay 
there. And then we have this final temperature. I'm going to take the knot out of there. That's represented by that. So what do we want to find out? We want to find out TF minus TF naught. Okay? That's what we want to find. Find. That's what the problem is asking us to do. Here you go. Find TF e sub F minus T of T sub F naught. All you have to do, you know, you don't have to do that for 100 degrees, by the way. You can do for any temperature. You're going to see you're going to get exactly the same result. So here you go. I'm going to get this equation right in here on the TF and this equation right in here on the TF naught. Don't forget to put the parentheses. Otherwise, you're going to get the incorrect result. Okay? So here you go. This guy goes on the left side. Okay? Let's not forget that the final temperature in degree C is going to be the initial temperature plus one degree, right? There you go. So let's do that. The final temperature here is going to be, I'm going to put a parenthesis right here. It's going to be the initial temperature plus one degree C. Plus one degree in variation. We are going to continue this equation step by step. I'm going to distribute this negative here in this parenthesis. And this negative here, this one. Okay. Note, see that the 32 cancel out to the 32. Okay. And what else happens? 32 cancel out with the 32, and the 950 TCO cancel out with the minus 950 TCO as well. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here, go let's get uh, let's expand that, right? Nine fifth degree. We do not need the parentheses anymore. This term cancel is this one. So what we get? We get a 1.8 degrees variation in the temperature in Fahrenheit when we increase the temperature by one degree C. That's the change in Fahrenheit. It happens at any temperature. It doesn't happen just at 100 degrees C or a zero degree C. So if you are, so here you go, if you are at any temperature and at any initial temperature and you increase the initial temperature by one degree C, Comma. get a variation of almost two degrees Fahrenheit, almost two degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. That's an interesting behavior of the Fahrenheit scale. 
graphically speaking, let me do a an illustration. Okay, here for you. Here, suppose that we have a thermometer. Here is my Celsius, my thermometer in the Celsius scale. Okay, and here is my thermometer in the Fahrenheit scale. The ruler of each of those are going to be slightly different. Okay, so you go. Here is the axis, right, of the Celsius scale. And make it a little bit thicker. And here is the one of the Fahrenheit scale. Put here the C. And you put this one at Fahrenheit. If each of those, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to show the units one degree C difference in the in this scale. Okay, so if you have one degree difference right here in degree C, what does it mean? It means that in the Fahrenheit scale, you're going to have almost two degrees difference. I can put another tick mark here in the Fahrenheit scale. Almost, it's not exactly two, but almost two is 1.8, right? A little bit less. So here we have a variation of almost two degrees Fahrenheit, whereas here we have a variation of only one degree C. That's how we can illustrate the two scales. put a little bit thicker here so you can see better in the slides right that uh, this rectangle here represents the bulb of the thermometer now let's talk about the Kelvin scale and let's see why it's so important let's not let's now talk about the Kelvin scale and why it is so important. Okay. Some time ago, people made scientists made a very important discovery. Okay, some time ago. Some time ago. People made a very scientists made a very important discovery. Very important discovery. They were using a special type of thermometer. They were using a special type of thermometer that uses the pressure of a gas in an enclosure to determine the temperature, to determine the temperature of a given volume. This 
thermometer, you know, is uh, works. This thermometer is a constant volume gas thermometer. Let me give you a, an illustration. Let me show you an illustration of how this thermometer works. We have a very good illustration right in here. Okay, right? so okay, go. Yeah, I want, let's go back to, to this one right here. Okay, here's an illustration of how this thermometer works, okay? So, everything, what you have right in here is a, is a glass. Glass tube, glass here, and glass here, okay? And what we have here, we have a flexible hose. Try to picture that. The volume in this right part of the gas is filled with a mercury, liquid mercury. And the end of the of this tube is kept open under outside pressure, atmospheric pressure, okay? So we feel this volume, you know, the gas stay all of here, okay? Not just here at the tip. We feel that with a gas. And then if you want to measure the temperature of the environment, we make sure that this bulb here, the gas, stays in thermal contact with the environment. In this case, for instance, we have a liquid and we put the bulb of this gas thermometer submerged in the liquid. So what's going to happen? If the temperature of the, of the liquid is too high, the gas will try to expand. Will try to expand. But then, Remember, I told you it's a constant volume gas. So we keep our measurement in such a way to keep this volume constant. This level that you see here always stay at the same spot. It's possible to do that just by raising or lowering this part of the gas thermometer. Remember, it's a flexible hose, right? If this position remains constant, something else has to give in. Don't forget, it's a constant volume. If it is a constant volume and the pressure increases, so this mercury reservoir column will have to raise or to lower, depend, go higher or lower, depending whether the pressure increases or decreases, right? So what do we do? We measure this height between this level and the other side. And this measurement here of the height of the mercury reservoir, reservoir is related to the temperature of the environment that's being measured. That's how the gas thermometer works. We have, uh, we have one of those there at Santa Monica College. When I used to teach there, I used to play with that gas thermometer. It works pretty well. Remember, it is constant volume, right? Gas thermometer. Constant volume gas thermometer means that this level right in here must remain the same spot, so this volume remains constant. And what you're changing is right in here. This is the height. So we, ha we have also the other type of thermometer. Instead of constant volume, we have also the constant pressure gas thermometer. So we have both ways to measure temperature. This type of thermometer, I would say, is the best one that we have out there. It was with this type of thermometer that we discovered something very important. OK, so let's go ahead and let me show you exactly what happens. When we perform experiments with a given gas at different temperatures, okay? and measure the pressure, 
at known temperatures, let me show you what we get. You know? So you go ahead, perform the experiment with that gas thermometer. And what we're doing, we're measuring the pressure of the gas. And we plot, we plot it against the temperature. We go ahead and set up a bath that we know it can be boiling water, one temperature, right? Boiling will be boiling water that we know that's 100 degrees C. Another temperature can be ice water. And then variations of that, right? So if you have boiling water, 100 degrees C, if you get no, 100 grams of boiling water, 100 degrees C, and mix, mix it with 100 grams of water at zero degrees C, the same amount of water, we know that we're going to have 50 degrees, right? So we perform this experiment. That height that you see is also a measure of the pressure, the, pre the pressure of the gas. Girl, temperature degree C and then what goes in the vertical line the pressure goes in the vertical line okay in Pascal Let's say we start at zero degrees C right in here. I'm gonna need those lines. Let's say here is a zero degree C, here is a hundred degree C. And then you have everything else in between. If you have a thermometer, gas thermometer, you can do that. It's going to take some time to do that, right? It'd be a nice experiment to set up in the lab. A gas thermometer. What do we find out when we, when we do this experiment? Here you go. We get a data point. There's going to be something around here. Somewhat like that. At 100, at uh, 0 degrees C. And we get another data point. And then we're using a given gas, oxygen, for instance. Then you mix equal amounts, equal masses of a zero degree C water and 100 degrees C water, we have another data point here in between, right? And so on. When we perform the experiment with a different temperature values, what we discover that we get a straight line, by the way. Just keep that in mind. Gas thermometers are one of the best ones to do this type of experiment. And by the way, it was with a gas thermometer that we discover this important relation. Okay, so I'm gonna change it a little slightly here. Yeah, I'll leave this way. I'm gonna put that's what we call a calibration curve of the gas. Yeah. I'm gonna put here you go gas one gas one we're talking about oxygen for instance then we repeat the experiment with a different gas and by the way I'm gonna do something else right I'm going to extrapolate this curve
it's very important to do this extrapolation. No gas can have pressure lower than zero Pascal. There is no such a thing as negative pressure. Okay? And then I go ahead and perform this experiment with a second gas. Let's say this one is oxygen, O2. I decide to, pre to, pre to perform an experiment with a, a different gas. Now it's going to be nitrogen, okay? N2. And let's say we get something else. Three data points again, right? All of them uh, can be more data points, doesn't have to be. Here we go. One at uh, zero degree C. Another one at 50 degrees C. But now we discover that the curve is a little bit at a different slope. Okay? And what we discover? We discover that when we extrapolate the second gas, it crosses the region of negative pressure at almost the same spot that the first one does. The region of zero pressure at almost the same spot that the first gas crossed. People did this experiment, you know, they did that for different gases, and they always get this type, different gases in the thermometer. They always get this result. You go, N2, and then you go for another gas, you know, a third gas. Here you go, the calibration, the calibration curve. The calibration curve. So here we have this other gas. Doesn't matter what gas that you use, you always get the same point where the extrapolated curve intercepts at pressure is zero, which is, here you go, a temperature value. Data point right in here. Data point here. Data point here. What so what scientists discovered? Scientists discovered that you cannot go. You know that the, you cannot go to pressure negative pressure. There is no such a thing as a negative pressure. So scientists figure out that if you don't have negative pressure, you cannot have a negative temperature value, a temperature value below this point. That's what scientists concluded. This temperature that you see right in here in this gas, they gave it a name. They call it the absolute zero. Okay, here you go. get that absolute zero temperature. <laughs> okay. That's where the Kelvin scale came from. 
this point where it we call the absolute zero we established as being the zero Kelvin and there is a relationship between the Kelvin scale and the centigrade or the Celsius scale absolute zero corresponds to 27 minus by the way minus 273.15 degree C yep. or minus 273.15 degrees C okay that's where the Kelvin scale comes from. And then the next step is what would be the relationship between Kelvin and, and Celsius. They established in a rather arbitrary fashion that a variation of 1 degree C corresponds to a variation of 1 Kelvin as well. So the relationship between the Kelvin scale and the centigrade scale Is the following. You know, I want to copy this one here. Temperature in Kelvin. Is going to be the temperature in C. Plus. 0 degrees C correspond to 273.15 Kelvin. Minus 273.15 C correspond to 0 Kelvin. It's linear. It's a, you know, a variation of 1 degree C in temperature correspond to a variation of one Kelvin. Let's go here to your book. Your book has a very good illustration here of a thermometer in the Celsius and Fahrenheit scale. Okay, so notice that from zero to 100 degrees C, you have a variation from 32 Fahrenheit to 212 Fahrenheit, which is 180 degrees Fahrenheit of variation, right? Divide by 100, you get 1.8 degrees. These are the conversion of the temperature and different temperature that we find out there. Absolute zero is zero Kelvin, minus 273.15 degrees C, minus 459.67 Fahrenheit, and so on, right? Intergalactic space is three Kelvin. Helium boils at 4.2 Kelvin. Water boils at 373 Kelvin, 100 degrees C. Incandescent light bulb filaments at 3000 Kelvin which is approximately 2,700 or 4,900 Fahrenheit. Surface of the sun, 6,300 Kelvin. Notice that at high, the higher the temperature you go, the closer the, is the Kelvin numeric value becomes to the degree C. And you have almost twice in degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Okay, so we can stop here right now and we're going to talk about thermal expansion next time.